evening and welcome to tonight's program that we are co-sponsoring with Elm Street Books and proud to do so. I am so thrilled to be able to tell you that our special guest author tonight is Dennis Lehane, which I'm sure you know because you're all here to listen to him, and that he will be staying after the program uh, to sign books. And also, if you'd like to have photographs taken with him, that's a possibility too, but he does ask that you uh, wait until the end of the book signing before you, uh, that he, before you take photographs with him or that he signs copies of books that you might have brought for him to sign. So, as I said, we're thrilled that he is here. As you know, he's the author of many well-known, award-winning books that include Mystic River and Shutter Island, both of which were also made into highly acclaimed films, as was a third book of his, Gone Baby Gone. His latest novel is Live By Night. In this book, Lehane returns to the gritty climate of Prohibition-era America that made one of his earlier novels, the Given Day, published in 2009, such a blockbuster success. Blending edge-of-your-seat suspense with vivid period detail, award-winning Dennis Lehane has created a masterful epic of this pivotal period in American history. Told in the voice of a dangerous yet charismatic young gangster, I think he calls himself an outlaw, not a gangster, rising in power during the, gla the glamour and violence of the Roaring Twenties. Dennis Lehane is the author of nine novels, as well as Coronado, a collection of short stories and a play. He was born and raised in the Dorchester neighborhood of Boston. He's a graduate of Eckerd College and the graduate program of writing at Florida International University in Miami, Florida. He's taught writing at many colleges, including advanced fiction writing at Harvard University. Before becoming a full-time writer, Dennis worked as a counselor with mentally handicapped and abused children, waited tables, parked cars, drove limos, worked in bookstores, that was the key job, I think, and loaded tractor trailers. His one regret is that no one ever gave him a chance to tend bar. Well, it, it might not be too late for that. He and his wife, Angie, divide their time between Boston and the Gulf, Clo Gulf Coast of Florida. Please join me in welcoming Dennis Lehane to New Canaan Library. Hi, how's everybody doing? Uh, okay, so nice of you to come out on such a raw and cold night. Um, oh, thank you. So I'm going to read a little bit from uh, my new book, Live by Night, and uh, then uh, I'll take some questions, which I find more fun than listening to me drone on. Um, and uh, I thought tonight, because it's, it's dark and rainy and cold, I'd read something sort of dark and cold. Um, this is, uh, this is a novel that, that, um, essentially is broken into three parts. It, it follows, uh, a guy on a sort of classic journey, um, up a ladder, but down the moral abyss. And, uh, he is, uh, uh, at this point a 20 year old, um, uh, outlaw, uh, who has, um, been arrested and, uh, is just been sent to jail. His father is a police superintendent. Um, the irony of all this is his father, uh, the upstanding member of society, is actually pretty corrupt, um, but in a weirdly principled way. And the son is uh, principled, but in an oddly corrupt way. Um, so uh, this was, um, oh shoot, and I gotta do one other thing. This is all new to me, this part of my reading. Yes, somebody guessed, glasses. <laughs> my wife, I'm 47, and my wife, an optometrist, has been actually quite um, annoyed that I didn't need glasses before this. So the triumph, when I finally, the sense of exultation when I went to actually get glasses this summer is actually kind of disturbing. Uh, all right, so this is, uh, this is basically a sequence in which um, Joseph Coughlin now enters prison, um, and uh, and all the all the bad things you could think of uh, about prison will sort of be laying on the page as a threat. Um, so I'm just going to read this, and I'll take questions. And again, this is 
I, I've been thinking about the, this is technically connected to the given day, um, but it, only insofar as, as a bloodline is connected. The one thing I would call, I'm writing the next book in this, and the one book, I, the one thing I would call up um, that connects these books is they're very much about the father and son relationship. And so this is a chapter that really brings all that home. Um, the distance from Suffolk County Jail to the Charlestown Penitentiary was a little more than a mile. Oh, it's uh, 1926, final thing. Uh, they could have walked it in the time it took to load them into the bus and both their ankle manacles to the floor. Four of them went over that morning, a thin Negro and a fat Russian whose no names Joe never learned, Norman, a soft and shaky white kid, and Joe. Norman and Joe had chatted a few times in jail because Norman's cell was across from Joe's. Norman had had the misfortune to fall under the spell of the daughter of a man whose livery stable he tended to on Pinckney Street in the flat of Beacon Hill. The girl, 15, got pregnant, and Norman, 17, an orphan since he was 12, got three years in a maximum security prison for rape. He told Joe he'd been reading his Bible and was ready to atone for his transgressions, told Joe the Lord would be with him and that there was good in every man, not the least of which could be found in the lowest of men, and that he suspected he might even find more good behind these walls than he'd found on the other side of them. Joe had never met a more terrified creature. As the bus bounced along the Charles River Road, a guard rechecked their manacles and introduced himself as Mr. Hammond. He informed them that they would be housed in East Wing, except, of course, for the Negro, who would be housed in South Wing with his own kind. But the rules apply to all of you, Mr. Hammond said. No matter what your color or creed, never look a guard in the eyes, never question a guard's order, never cross over the dirt track that runs along the wall, never touch yourselves or one another in an unwholesome manner. Just do your time like good fish, without complaint or ill will, and we'll find harmonious accord along the pathway to your restitution. The prison was over 100 years old. Its original dark granite buildings had been joined by red brick structures of more recent vintage. Designed in a cruciform style, the heart of it was comprised of four wings branching off a central tower. Atop the tower was a cupola, manned at all times by four guards with rifles, one for each direction a prisoner could run. It was surrounded by train tracks and factories, foundries and mills that stretched from the north end down the river to Somerville. The factories made stoves and the mills made textiles and the foundries reeked of magnesium and copper and cast iron gases. When the bus dropped down the hill and into the flats, the sky took cover behind a ceiling of smoke. An eastern freight train blew its whistle and they had to wait for it to rattle past them before they could cross the tracks and travel the final 300 yards onto prison grounds. The bus pulled to a stop, and Mr. Hammond and another guard unlocked their manacles, and Norman started to shiver, and then he blubbered, the tears dripping off his jaw like sweat. Joe said, Norman. Norman looked across at him. Don't do that. But Norman couldn't stop. Joe's cell was on the top tier of East Wing. It baked in the sun all day long and held the heat through the night. There was no electricity in the cells themselves. They reserved that for the corridors, the mess hall, and the killing chair in the death house. Cells were lit by candlelight. Indoor plumbing had yet to come to Charlestown Prison, so cellmates pissed and shat in wooden buckets. His cell was built for a single prisoner, but they'd stacked four beds in it. His three cellmates were named Oliver, Eugene, and Toombs. Oliver and Eugene were garden variety stick-up guys from Revere and Quincy, respectively. Toombs was older and quieter. He had stringy hair and stringy limbs, and something foul lived behind his eyes that you didn't want to look at. As the sun set on their first night, he sat on the top bunk, legs dangling over the edge, and every now and then Joe found his blank stare turned in his direction. And it was all he could do to meet it, and then casually move off it. Joe slept on one of the low bunks across from Oliver. He had the worst mattress, and the bunk sagged, and his sheet was coarse and moth-eaten and smelled like wet fur. He dozed fitfully, but he never slept. In the morning, Norman approached him in the yard. Both of his eyes were black, and his nose looked to be broken, and Joe was about to ask him about it when Norman scowled, bit down on his lower lip, and punched Joe in the neck. Joe two-stepped to his right and ignored the sting and thought of asking why, but he didn't have enough time. Norman came for him, both arms awkwardly raised. If Norman avoided his head and started punching his body, Joe was done. His broken ribs still weren't healed. Sitting up in the morning hurt so much he saw stars. He shuffled, his heels, heels scrabbling the dirt. 
High above them, the guards in their watchtowers watched the river to the west or the ocean to the east. Norman drilled a punch into the other side of his neck, and Joe raised his foot and brought it down on Norman's kneecap. Norman fell onto his back, his right leg, and an awkward ankle. He rolled in the dirt, then used his elbow to try to stand. When Joe stomped the knee a second time, half the, heart, half the yard heard Norman's leg break. The sound that left his mouth wasn't quite a scream. It was something softer and deeper, a huffing noise, something a dog would make after it crawled under a house to die. Norman lay in the dirt, and his arms fell to his sides, and the tears leaked from his eyes into his ears. Joe knew he could help him up, now that he was no danger, but that would be seen as weakness. He walked away. He walked across the yard, already sweltering at 9 a.m., and felt the eyes on him, more than he could count, everyone looking, deciding what the next test would be, how long they'd toy with the mouse before they took a real swipe with their claws. Norman was nothing. Norman was a warm-up. And if anyone here got a sense of how badly Joe's ribs were damaged, it hurt to breathe at the moment, it hurt to walk, there'd be nothing but bones left by the morning. Joe had seen Oliver and Eugene over by the west wall, but now he watched their backs melt into a crowd. They wanted no part of him until they saw how this played out. So now he was walking toward a group of men he didn't know. If he stopped suddenly and looked around, he'd look foolish. And foolish in here was the same thing as weak. He reached the group of men and the far side of the yard by the wall, but they walked away too. It went that way all day. No one would talk to him. Whatever he had, no one wanted to catch it. He returned that night to an empty cell. His mattress, the lumpy one, lay on the floor. The other mattresses were gone. The bunks had been removed. Everything had been removed except the mattress, the scratchy sheet, and the shit bucket. Joe looked back at Mr. Hammond as he locked the door behind him. Where'd everyone else go? Mr. Hammond said they went and walked off down the tier. For the second night in a row, jo Joe lay in the hot room and barely slept. It wasn't just his ribs, and it wasn't simply fear. The reek, of the, pr the reek of the prison was matched only by the reek of the factories outside. There was a small window at the top of the cell, ten feet up. Maybe the thought behind placing it there had meant to give the prisoner a merciful taste of the outside world. But now it was just a conduit for the factory smoke, for the stench of textiles and burning coal. In the heat of the, c in the, heat of the cell, as vermin scuttled along the walls and men groaned in the night, Joe could not fathom how he could survive five days here, never mind five years. He'd lost Emma, he'd lost his freedom, and now he could feel his soul beginning to flicker and wane. What they were taking from him was all he had. The next day, more of the same, and the day after that, anyone he approached walked away from him, anyone he made eye contact with looked away, but he could feel them watching as soon as his gaze moved on. It was all they did, every man in prison. They watched him, waiting. For what? He asked at lights out as Mr. Hammond turned the key in the cell door. What are they waiting for? Mr. Hammond stand through the bar, stared through the bars at him with his lightless eyes. The thing is, Joe said, I'm happy to straighten things out with whoever I offended. If I did, in fact, offend anyone. Because if I did, I didn't do so knowingly. So I'm willing to... You're in the mouth of it, Mr. Hammond said. He looked up at the tears arrayed above and behind him. It decides to roll you around on its tongue or it bites down real hard like, grinds its teeth into you, or it lets you climb over them teeth and jump out. But it decides, not you. Mr. Hammond swung his enormous ring of keys in a circle before hooking them to his belt. You wait. For how long, Joe asked. Till it says so, Mr. Hammond said, and walked away. Doing okay? Yes. Didn't think you were going to prison tonight, did you? The boy who came for him next was just that, a boy, trembling and jump-eyed and no less dangerous for it. Joe was walking in to the Saturday shower when the kid dislodged himself from the line about 10 men up and walked down toward Joe. Joe knew from the moment the kid left the line that he was coming for him, but there was nothing he could do to stop it. The kid wore his striped prison pants and coat and carried his towel and soap bar like the rest of them, but he also had a potato peeler in his right hand, its edge sharpened by a whetstone. Joe stepped to meet the kid, and the kid acted like he was moving on, but then he dropped his towel and soap, planted his foot, and swung his arm at Joe's head. Joe fainted to his right, and the kid must have 
anticipated that because he went to his left and sank the potato peeler into Joe's inner thigh. Joe didn't have time to register the pain before he heard the kid pull it out, and it was the sound that enraged him. It sounded like fish part, parts sucked down a drain. His flesh, his blood, hung off the edge of that weapon. On his next pass, the kid lunged for Joe's abdomen or groin. Joy couldn't tell in all the ragged breathing and left, right, right, left scrabbling. He stepped inside the kid's arms and gripped the back of his head and pulled it to his chest. The kid stabbed him again, this time in the hip, but it was feeble stab with no momentum behind it. It still hurt worse than a dog bite. When the kid pulled his arm back to get a better thrust, Joe ran him backward until he cracked the kid's head against the granite wall. The kid sighed and dropped the potato peeler, and Joe banged his head off the wall twice more to be sure, and the kid slid to the floor. Joe had never seen him before. In the infirmary, a doctor cleaned his wounds, sutured the one in his thigh, and wrapped it tightly in gauze. The doctor, who smelled of something chemical, told him to keep off the leg and the hip for a while. How do I do that, Joe said. The doctor went on as if Joe had never spoken, and keep the wounds clean, change that dressing twice a day. Do you have more dressing for me? No, the doctor said, as if embittered by the stupidity of the question. So, good as new, the doctor said, and stepped back. He waited for the guards to come and mete out their punishment for the fight. He waited to hear if the boy who had attacked him was alive or dead, but no one said anything to him. It was as if he'd imagined the whole incident. It lights out. He asked Mr. Hammond if he'd heard about the fight on the way to the showers. No. No, you didn't hear, Joe asked, or no, it didn't happen? No, Mr. Hammond said and walked away. A few days after the stabbing, an inmate spoke to him. There was little special about the man's voice. It was lightly accented, Italian, he guessed, and a bit gravelly. But after a week of almost total silence, it sounded so beautiful that Joe's throat closed up and his chest filled. He was an old man with thick glasses too big for his face. He approached Joe in the yard as Joe limped across it. He'd been in the line to the showers on Saturday. Joe remembered him because he looked so frail, one could only imagine the horrors this place had foisted upon him over the years. Do you think they'll run out of men to fight you soon, he said. He was about Joe's height, bald up top, a shade of silver on the sides that matched his pencil-thin mustache, long legs and a short, pudgy torso, tiny hands. Something delicate about the way he moved, almost tiptoeing like a cat burglar, but eyes as innocent and hopeful as a child's on his first day of school. I don't think they can run out, Joe said. It's a lot of candidates. Won't you get tired? Sure, Joe said, but I'll go as long as I can, I guess. You're very fast, the old man said. I'm fast. I'm not very fast. You are, though. The old man handed a small canvas pouch. The old man opened a small canvas pouch and removed two cigarettes. He handed one to Joe. I've seen both your fights. You're so fast, most of these men haven't noticed you're protecting your ribs. Joe stopped as the man lit their cigarettes with a match he struck off his thumbnail. I'm not protecting anything. The old man smiled. A long time ago, in another life, before this, he gestured past the walls and the wire. I promoted a few boxers, a few wrestlers, too. I never made much money, but I met a lot of pretty women. Boxers attract pretty women, and pretty women travel with other pretty women. He shrugged as they began walking again. So I know when a man is protecting his ribs. Are they broken? There's nothing wrong with them. I promise, the old man said. The old man said, if they send me to fight you, I'll limit myself to grasping your ankles and holding on tight. <laughs> Joe chuckled. Just the ankles, huh? Well, maybe the nose, the old man said, if I sense an advantage. Joe looked over at him. He must have been here so long he'd seen every hope die and experienced every degradation, and now they left him alone because he'd survived all they'd thrown at him, or because he was just a bag of wrinkles, unappealing, unappealing for purposes of trade, harmless. Well, to protect my nose, Joe took a long drag off the cigarette. A few months ago, I broke six ribs and fractured or sprained the wrist. A few months ago, the man said. That leaves you only a couple of months to go. No, really? The old man nodded. Broken hib ribs are like broken hearts, at least six months before they heal. Is that how long it takes, Joe thought. If only meals lasted as long, the old man rubbed his small paunch. What do they call you? Joe. Never Joseph? Just my father. The man nodded and exhaled a stream of smoke with slow relish. This is such a hopeless place. Even in your limited time here, I'm sure you've come to the same conclusion. Joe nodded. It eats men. Doesn't even spit them back out. How long have you been here? 
Oh, the old man said. I stopped counting years ago. He looked up at the greasy blue sky and spit a piece of tobacco off his tongue. There's nothing about this place I don't know. If you need help comprehending it, just ask. Joe doubted the old fellow was as tuned to the pulse of the place as he imagined himself to be, but he saw, saw no harm in saying, I will. Thank you. I appreciate your offer. They reached the end of the yard. As they turned to walk back, walk back the way they'd come, the man placed his arm around Joe's shoulders. The whole yard watched. The old man flicked his cigarette into the dust and held out his hand, and Joe shook it. My name, he said, is Tommaso Pescatori, but everyone calls me Maso. Consider yourself under my care. Joe knew the name. Maso Pescatori ran the North End and most of the gambling and women on the North Shore. From behind these walls, he controlled a lot of the liquor coming up from Florida. Tim Hickey had done a lot of work with him over the years and usually mentioned that extreme caution was the only sensible course of action when dealing with the man. I didn't ask to be under your care, Maso. How many things in life, good or bad, come to us whether we ask for them or not? Maso removed his arm from Joe's shoulder and placed a hand over his eyebrows to block the sun. Where Joe had just seen innocence, he now saw cunning. Call me Mr. Pescatori from now on, Joseph, and give this to the, your father the next time you see him. Maso slipped a piece of paper into Joe's hand. Joe looked at the address scrawled there, 1417 Blue Hill Avenue. That was it. No name, no telephone number, just an address. Hand it to your father. Just this once. It's all I ask of you. What if I don't, Joe said. Maso seemed genuinely confused by the question. He tilted his head to one side and looked at Joe, and a small and curious smile found his lips. The smile widened and turned into a soft laugh. He shook his head several times. He gave Joe a two-finger salute and walked back to the wall where his men stood wait waiting. In the visiting room, Thomas watched his son limp across the floor and take his seat. What happened? Guy stabbed me in the leg. Why? Joe shook his head. He slid his palm across the table, and Thomas saw the piece of paper under it. He closed his hand over his son's for a moment, relishing the contact and trying to remember why he'd refrained from initiating it for over a decade. He took the piece of paper and placed it in his pocket. He looked at his son, and his dark-ringed eyes, and sullied spirit, and he saw the whole of it suddenly. I'm to do someone's bidding, he said. Joe looked up from the table and met his eyes. Who's bidding, Joseph? Maso Pescatoris. Thomas sat back and asked himself just how much he loved his son. Joe read the question in his eyes. Don't try to tell me you're clean, Dad. His father said, I do civilized business with civilized people. You're asking me to get under the thumb of a bunch of dagos one generation removed from a cave. It's not under their thumb. No? What's on the piece of paper? An address. Just an address? Yeah, I don't know any more than that. His father nodded several times. Because you're a child. Some WAP gives you an address to give your father a member of police command, and you don't grasp that the only thing that address could be is the location of a rival's illicit supply. Of what? Most likely a warehouse filled to the bursting with liquor. His father stared up at the ceiling and ran a hand over his trim white hair. Joe said he said just this once. His father gave him a, le gave him a malevolent smile. And you believed him. He left the prison. He walked down the path toward his car, surrounded by the smell of chemicals. Smoke rose from the factory stacks. It was dark gray in most places, but it turned the sky brown and the earth black. Trains chugged along the outskirts. For some re odd reason, they reminded Thomas of wolves circling a medical tent. He had sent at least a thousand men here over the course of his career. Many of them had died behind the granite walls. If they arrived with any illusions about human decency, they lost those straight away. There were too many prisoners and too few guards for the prison to be anything as, but what it was, a dumping ground and then a proving ground for animals. If you went in a man, you left a beast. If you went in an animal, you honed your skills. He feared his son was too soft. For all his transgressions over the years, his lawlessness, his inability to obey Thomas or the rules or much of anything, Joseph was the most open of his sons. You could see his heart through the heaviest winter coat. Thomas reached a call box at the end of the path. His key was attached to his watch chain, and he used it now to open the box. He looked at the address in his hands, 1417 Blue Hill Avenue in Mattapan. 
Jew country, which meant the warehouse was probably owned by Jacob Rosen, a known supplier of Albert White. Thomas looked back at the prison his son called home, a tragedy, but not surprising. His son had chosen the path that led him here over years of Thomas' strenuous subjection and disapproval. If Thomas used this call box, he was wedded to the pescatory mob for life, to a race of people who had brought to the shores of this country anarchism and its bombers, assassins, and the black hand, and now organized in something rumored to be called Omerta Organiza, they had overtaken by force the entire business of illegal liquor. And he was supposed to give them more, work for them, kiss their rings. He closed the call box door, returned his watch to his pocket, and walked to his car. For two days, he considered the piece of paper. For two days, he prayed to the God he feared didn't exist, prayed for guidance, prayed for his son behind those granite walls. Saturday was his day off, and Thomas was up on a ladder, repainting the black trim of the window sills of the K Street row house, when a man called up for directions. It was a hot and humid afternoon, a few purple clouds undulating in his direction. He looked through a window on the third floor into what had once been his oldest son Aidan's room. It had stood empty for three years before his wife Ellen had taken it over as a sewing room. She had passed in her sleep two years ago, so now it sat empty except for a pedal-charged sewing machine and a wooden rack in which hung the items that had been awaiting mending two years ago. Thomas dipped his brush into the can. It would always be Aidan's room. I'm a bit turned around. Thomas looked down the ladder at the man standing on the sidewalk 30 feet below. He wore a light blue seersucker, white shirt, and a red bow tie, no hat. How can I help, Thomas said. I'm looking for the L Street bathhouse. From up here, Thomas could see the bathhouse, and not just the roof, the whole of its brick edifice. He could see the small lagoon beyond it, and beyond the lagoon, the Atlantic, stretching all the way to the land of his birth. End of the street. Thomas pointed, gave the man a nod, and turned back to his paintbrush. The man said, right down the end of the street, huh? Right down there? Thomas turned back and nodded, his eyes on the man now. Sometimes I can't get out of my own way, the man said. Ever happen to you? You know what you should do, but you just can't get out of your own way? The man was bl blonde and bland, handsome in a forgettable way, neither tall nor short, fat nor thin. They won't kill him, he said pleasantly. Thomas said, excuse me, and dropped the brush into the paint can. The man put his hand on the ladder. From there, it wouldn't take much. He squinted up at Thomas and then looked down the street. They'll make him wish they did, though. Make him wish that every day of his life. You understand my rank with the Boston Police Department, Thomas said. He'll think about suicide, the man said. Of course he will but they'll keep him alive by promising to kill you if he does. And every day, they'll think of a new thing to try on him. A black Model T pulled off the curb and idled in the middle of the street. The man left the sidewalk, climbed in, and they drove away, taking the first left they found. Thomas climbed down, surprised to see the shakes in his forearms, even after he entered his house. He was getting old, very old. He shouldn't be up on ladders. He shouldn't be standing on principle. The way of the old was to allow the new to push you aside with as much grace as you could muster. He called Kenny Donlin, the captain of the 3rd District in Mattapan. For five years, Kenny had been Thomas's lieutenant at the 6th in South Boston. Like many of the department command staff, he owed his success to Thomas. And on your day off, no less, Kenny said when his secretary patched Thomas through. Ah, uh, there's no days off for the likes of us, boy, Thomas said. That's the truth of it, Kenny said. How can I help you, Thomas? 1417 Blue Hill Avenue, Thomas said. It's a warehouse, supposedly for gaming parlor equipment. But that's not what's in there, Kenny said. No. How hard do you want it hit? Down to the last bottle, Thomas said, and something inside of him cried out as it died. Down to the last drop. That's it. Thank you. Can I take some questions? Anybody? 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 Yes, sir. I will have to skip you over. Oh, thank you. Sir, I will have to give you the donut and the roll call. The given day. Okay. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and you have good readers, too. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm a writer too. A okay. Writer. Yep. So, uh, I used to radio. Okay. I'm very interested in your writing routine. Can you talk about, you know. Can I talk about my writing routine? Writing and what you write on and when you rewrite and so on. Okay. Uh, sure. Can I talk about my typical writing routine? Do I, um, what do I write on? Do I rewrite? Um, I have two kids now and um, uh, that's distilled everything. I have no time left. Simple as that. I just don't have time. So I have to maximize my time. And because at best, I got four hours in the morning. Um, that has made me a way better writer. Way better. I have to hit those four hours. They matter. I sit down in that chair. I don't goof around. I mean, I took five years to write The Given Day. And part of the reason I took five years to write The Given Day is because it's a 700-page epic with a cast of hundreds um, that spans 13 of the most tumultuous months in American history. The other reason it took me five years to write The Given Day is because I was single, and I was goofing off a lot, playing a lot of Madden and video games and, and you know, finding excuses to go drinking in the middle of the day with my friends. And, you know, I mean, it just – it was – uh, you give me, you give somebody all the time in the world, they'll take all the time in the world. Compress their time, and if they really want it, they'll find it. Um, so I get up first thing in the morning. My one rule for my family that I just can't change, I've tried it and it was disastrous every time, is the mornings are mine. I own them. I don't take my daughter to school. I don't, I don't do any of those things. I tried it, and I loved doing it. But by the time I got to my desk, I, I didn't write. Problem is, is what Wordsworth termed the world is too much with you by that point. You, if you're going to write, um, the, there's most writers I know um, write either first thing in the morning, very late at night, or under the influence of something. And the reason is, the reason is nobody's ever made the connection. They just think, oh, writers are drunks. But no, or, or you know, drug addicts. But the reason is, it's the quickest way to connect to the dream world. If you get up first thing in the morning, you're still very connected to the dream world. So just stay in it. Don't read papers. Don't talk to people. Don't anything. Get to your desk. If you get to your desk, get a way better shot of still being in 1920 or 1940 or 19 or 2010, but in an alternate universe, which is the world of your characters. So that's what I do. I go right to my desk. I, I have an office. I rent an office um, in a neighborhood two over from mine. I drive to it. I get there, I, um, I go right to my desk, and I drop into, right now I'm writing a book set in 1943, and I, I drop into that time period, and I, I write. Um, rewriting, I rewrite nonstop. People who don't rewrite, in the words of Tumi, um, Truman Capote once said this to Jack Kerouac, actually. He said, that's not writing, my dear, that's typing. Uh, <laughs> and I agree, you know, I mean, it, you know, I'm sorry, it may sound like a great idea when it comes out of you, but it's probably not. It needs honing. It needs to be. It needs to be chiseled. It needs to be worked on. So I'm. Do you that's write on a keyboard? I write both. I write longhand or I write uh, on my PC. It just depends upon the mood I'm in. A lot of times I write longhand. Sometimes I'll write longhand for a bit and then I'll be inputting it into the computer and I'll just keep going. So anybody who wants to study my papers is in for hell, you know, because <laughs> it's just what happened to those forty-seven pages? Uh, they went right onto the the PC. So. Sir? So, speaking from a different angle, I'm thinking more about um, do you research uh, old archives, newspapers, and look at old like buildings or hotels? I think to do that would be fair. But I was just okay. wondering how you capture all that research. Oh, how do I do? I how much research do I do for sort of what I'm capturing, say here? The, the single thing I researched the mo or tried to research the most for this book was Charlestown Penitentiary because I knew I was going to do three chapters on it, and I knew that it was where Sacramento and Benzetti had been executed. So I figured there'd be plenty of documents. They were ex they're executed during this book. He's there during the time they were executed. And um, so I thought, okay, I, I, I'll find something. I couldn't find anything. I mean, I couldn't find anything. I went to the Mass Archives. I'm a trustee of the Boston Public Library, so I have a lot of access Nothing. It's like it all vanished. There's some blueprints, there's some documents, but there's just not much. So I found the cruciform model of the prison. I got one architectural um, blueprint that I got to look at. It wasn't detailed at all. I got a good look at it, and I said, okay, that's, um, that's where I'm just going to work from here. I couldn't find out 
what factories were around it. Just every document talked about all the factories that were around it, but they didn't say which kind. Um, if you, I couldn't find a map that would show me the business names of things that were around it. I found out that there were train tracks around it. I know the current location. That I mean, the, if you ever know Charlestown at all, or if you know Boston at all, it's if you're ever in Charlestown, there's a bridge called the Gilmore Bridge, and old timers call it the Prison Point Bridge. The reason they call it the Prison Point Bridge is because where the prison was. So now it's Bunker Hill Community College. So see, I went and I stared at Bunker Hill, Bunker Hill Community College from across the street, and then I just conjured it up as a prison, figured the geography wasn't too different, and then I just dropped a bunch of factories around it, and I let my imagination run. And I think in the end, my strength I've found as a writer in general is, in terms of research, is give me the basics. Just give me the base stuff. What do I need to know? And then let me run with everything else. And it might be my strength as a writer, too, because I know when I was working on The Wire, that was something, a TV show on HBO, that was something, the very first script I ever did, the scene where I finally came into my own was the one with very concrete notes, but they were very small. It was Stringer Bell has to have a conversation with his men and he runs into the problems of all man middle managers everywhere, which is you can't find good help. And that was the note. And then I turned it into something. I just blew it up. And I kept the essence of the note, but then I made it my own with what I, it, David Simon said. That's the moment we realized we didn't screw up when we hired you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so that, I think, is really with me. If I over-research, I kill my stuff. If I over-outline, I kill my stuff. So I just need to know my basics. So even like when people say, how much do you know about a book when you start? I usually know three things. One thing from the beginning, one thing from the middle, one thing from the end. Anything else hems me in, and I don't, and I don't find the experience pleasurable. The only time I ever knew every major beat of a book was Shutter Island, and it's still the most miserable writing experience I've ever had. I don't, I, if people say, I love Shutter Island, I just think, really? Because all I think is how much I hate that book, not because it's a, not because it's a bad book, but I hated the writing of it so much that I, I wrote that book faster than almost any book I ever wrote, and the only reason was because I hated doing it. I was like, I'm going to bring this home. That's it. So. No, Shutter Island, the problem was I had to know everything. You can't write that book. It's a Rubik's Cube. If you don't know every single major thread, then that book collapses. So I knew all, say, 26 major beats of that book, which is 23 more than I know going into most books. And so it made it a miserable experience. I knew what was happening. And yeah, it was a downer. I mean, I knew. I'd have these days where I'd be like, woohoo, Teddy did good today. And then I'd be like, yeah, but he's fucked. You know what I mean? He's screwed, you know? <laughs> and then I'd get all sad again, you know? So, yes, ma'am. Do I have a favorite of my books? Yeah. yeah which one? I have three. <laughs> I, I have ten novels, so you can't ask me to pick. Between. I'm not going to say all my kids are beautiful, but uh, three of them are, are definitely my shining stars, in my opinion. They're my personal favorites, and that would be Mystic River, The Given Day, and this one. And the reason is um, because each book represents, they represent different times in my life, so that's, that's why it's a personal decision. Mystic River was the first book where I broke away from anything in a series and said, I don't care what anybody expects. I'm going to write this book that's been in me now for 10 years. So Mr. Weaver took a long time bubbling up. So that, and, and uh, The Given Day, another book where I said I want to do something, I want to do something that, that makes a definitive statement about Boston. I want to say, I want to document something very specific about Boston in an epic way. I want to give Boston its epic, if you will. Um, with all due respect to the last hurrah and to mortal friends and to, you know, but I want to give, put my own epic stamp on Boston and then, uh, live by night because I'd always wanted to write a gangster novel since I was a little kid. And because my wife, um, had, uh, which is a really weird s feeling to go through. My wife had the hots for Joe so bad. <laughs> I was starting to get jealous and. <laughs> And she was, she was driving the writing of this book. She was just like every day, like, where's my next Joe st chapter? Where's my next Joe chapter? And that's a wonderful feeling when you're writing, you know? Um, and then the commonality that all three have and uh, that all three share is that all three were the three books that were the closest between what I had in my head 
to what reached the page, which is an extremely difficult proposition. You very rarely hit that, and I didn't. You don't hit it, but I, I would say I batted about 800 in each of these books. So I'm very happy with them in that, in that regard. Am I going to pick up my series again? Angie and Patrick, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. They came back after 11 years for one book, and then they said, we'd like to go relax now again. <laughs> and Patrick does funny things uh, that I don't realize he's doing at the time. At the end of Prayers for Rain, uh, a friend of mine wrote to me, George Pelicanos read it early, wrote to me and said, do you understand how many times Patrick uses the word tired in this book? <coughs> and I went back and I looked through it, and it was. He was exhausted. And the book is very much about him being exhausted. And it was me. And then just today in the Washington Post, they opened with the line that at the end of the mo uh, of Moonlight Mile, Patrick Kenzie retires to go get a master's degree in history. And they said, which is a very thinly veiled reference by the author to his own, uh, which is like, no, it's not thinly veiled. I didn't even know it until you wrote it. <laughs> uh, but I thought, that's not bad. It said it's a very, very thinly veiled reference by the author to his intention to go write books that are set in the past. And I thought, that makes me look so much smarter than I am. Uh, I don't know that I'm always, I actually have a, a trilogy plan in my head um, that's gonna be set in the present day um, about a, a, a police officer with, with um, uh, who's, who's dying, who, who catches a cold case that begins to, uh, I have that idea in my head, but um, that's a contemporary. But right now I'm following this bloodline and I, Joe took over my life in so many ways, and when a character, when a character speaks to you at high volume, you never turn them off until they stop talking, never, because it is so rare, and you never know when it's going to happen again that you don't do a single thing to mess with it. And so right now, this guy will not stop talking to me, and so I just keep listening. And he's on in his next book right now. It's set in the 1940s. And if he goes on into the 1950s, then I'm going with him until the well runs dry. Because the point is, is the well can run dry a lot. And I'm not one of those authors. I can't produce a book a year. I can't produce, I can't produce um, anything from a purely intellectual place. I can't say, this is a great idea. Let me write that down for 400, pa 400 pages. Doesn't work. I have to get really impassioned. And it has to be kind of illogical. It's a little bit like falling in love. And if I fall in love with a book, my editor said this to me over and over and over again. If you're in love with a book, I want that book. I don't give a shit about what it's about. I want that book. And I'm like, you got it. And so that's really my only, that's my only law for myself. It's, I have two laws. I don't, that, and then my other thing, I always say this, people say, do you think about the audience? I don't. Um, in, in, in so far as that doesn't mean I don't respect you. I love you guys. You guys are the reason I have a career. But here's what I feel I owe you. I do not owe you the book you, you expect under any circumstances. All I owe you is the greatest story I can tell, and I very much owe you this. I owe you that I leave everything I've got on the field, that there's nothing left of me when I finish a book, that I give it every single bit of me. And then I, if I hand that book over, then I feel like I've fulfilled our contract, and hopefully you'll continue reading me. But I'm not giving you Mystic River 2, bitches. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. No, that's just imagination. No, it's just imagination. I'm terrified, petrified of prison. Petrified. My brother uh, was a captain for 20 years in maximum security prisons in, 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 in Massachusetts. And he'd always be like, I can get you in there. And I'd be like, why? <laughs> why? You know, he's like, for research, why? I don't want to go. Uh, uh, I can just, I fear, like, I, that would be the day. It would be in the movie. The day that I would go in the prison is the day that there would be a riot, throw it into lockdown, I get stuck behind bars. And it's not as true anymore, but I used to be very pretty. And, <laughs> and so I feared that deeply. Uh, so I, um, I was never, you know, a tough guy. I was always kind of the pretty boy. So... Uh, I, uh, yeah, no prison for me, thank you. So when I wrote this, when I knew Joe was going to prison, I said, what's every fear you've got? Put it in there. Put every fear that you can think of. That doesn't mean that the fears will be borne out, 
but I wanted you to feel boom, 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 every second he's behind bars. Um, and there's a scene that comes up a little bit later that is, I think, arguably, it's a scene that ultimately nothing happens in, but I think it's one of the most terrifying things. I think it's the most terrifying thing I've ever written. And, and that's when he, has, he ends up having to sit in his cell with four guys in the dark who won't acknowledge him, who play cards and use chicken bones as an ante. And they just sit there and they just stare at him and they play cards for hours. And I was like, this is the most terrifying thing I can think of. <laughs> so that's all. Just use, I mean, the thing is, we're too literal in age sometimes now. I feel like, you know, how much research do you want to do before you just let your imagination rip? You know, that's why we got into this. I got into this because I like sitting in rooms, staring at ceilings, thinking, shut up. That's it. That's the end of the day. That's the story. People say, where do your ideas come from? Sitting in a room, staring at a ceiling, thinking shit up. That's my job. So, sir, there was somebody over here? Yeah. When did what? It was in the 50s. It was in the uh, early 50s. It was crumbling. Uh, it was literally crumbling all over the place. Those, the, um, uh, the, as I understand the conditions in that prison in the 1920s, there still wasn't electricity. Um, in the cells, you had to use candlelight. So uh, it was it was really bad, and it was commission after commission after commission, human rights commission after commission after commission, recommended that it be torn down, and then they finally started building one out in Walpole at Cedar Junction, and that's when it that's when they could tear it down. So as far as I understand it, ma'am, there was one in front. Yes. Yep. Yes, I will repeat. Don't worry, I'll repeat. Yep. And Okay, uh, she started reading me because Stephen King uh, gave me a lovely uh, shout-out in a New York Times book review about 12 years ago now. Um, and uh, who do I read? Well, um, the biggest influences on me were uh, the novelist Richard Price, um, Pete Dexter, William Kennedy, Elmore Leonard's Detroit novels. Um, I would say... I would say those really, and Raymond Carver, the short story writer Raymond Carver, those were, were, were to me the, the single, when I look back and I say, who really, who, who, who altered me as a writer, who, who changed me as a writer, those were the people. Like, and who did I add, you know, who did I, whose altar did I worship at? Who did I learn so much from? Those were the people. Then you just blow the scope out. Then you start going Fitzgerald, Edith Wharton, Toni Morrison, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, Walker Percy, uh, Chekhov, um, Flannery O'Connor, uh, you know, a uh, lot of short story writers, um, uh, Robert Parker, Richard Stark, uh, the, you know, a uh, lot of, um, then the spectrum gets huge. Laurie Moore, I mean, d it just gets massive. But when you look at people who, like, directly influenced me, I always think those are, the, those are the ones. They're urban novelists at the end of the day. Like, it's no mistake that when I mentioned the Elmore Leonard novels that most meant the most to me, and I didn't even realize this for a while, it's not the Florida novels. It's the Detroit novels. It's, it's the stuff he wrote about Dodge, Maine. It's the stuff he wrote about the, uh, without knowing he was even doing it maybe, about how the auto industry's collapse was informing the crime of that city. And he wasn't, Elmer Leonard's not a, a bully pulpit writer. It's just in there. It's in the fabric. And so I became fascinated with Detroit because of Elmer Leonard. So that's sort of those, are really at the end of the day, I consider myself with an exception here or there, a detour there and there, here and there an urban novelist who writes occasionally about crime. If you want to call me a crime novelist, great. You want to call me a mystery novelist, I say okay, although I don't ever remember a, a memorable mystery I wrote. You know, not the mystery. Nobody reads my books for the mystery. People say, oh, no, but Mystic River. I read Mystic River for the mystery. I say, really quick, who did it? <laughs> Nobody can ever remember. Nobody. Uh, oh, right, the kids. You know, <laughs> boom, it takes some time. So... Um, that's, that's why I, uh, I feel like really Mystic River is not about, uh, it's not about who done it. It's really about just the corrosive effect of violence on this community. So that's, yeah. yes, sir. Um, I have not read your introduction to Rose Pink, Some of the Better Square, but could you talk about, um, that culture and its influence on Boston politics? Well, the Friends of Eddie Coyle, uh, I wrote an introduction for that book. The Friends of Eddie Coyle, um, is actually, um, it's, it's, it's one of the watershed books of the last, it, certainly in American crime fiction, it's one of the watershed books of the last 50 years. 
It's one of the most important books ever written in American crime fiction, without a doubt. It did not particularly influence me because I came to it actually late. I don't say that in the introduction, but I came to The Friends of Eddie Coyle through Elmore Leonard, who was very deeply influenced by it because of the dialogue. It's, if the Friends of Eddie Coyle is almost 80% dialogue, and it's maybe it's, – it's about 20% straight prose, and it's just one of the richest books ever written, and it's one of the best books ever written about the real way crime works. Um, and it's got a great coda. It's not in the movie at all. The movie's great too. But at the end of The Friends of Eddie Coyle, it doesn't matter. It's not telling you anything. At one point, there's just these two prosecutors, and they go through the whole book like a Greek chorus. And one of them says – I mean – the book it really ends with the, these two guys walking up the courthouse steps in downtown Boston, and one guy says, I mean, what's the fucking point? You know? I mean, one guy dies, another guy gets arrested, another guy comes out, he starts doing crime, another guy gets busted, they all go to jail, and no, but nothing changes. And then one guy says, what well, does change? Some people die, new people come up, it's progress, you know? <laughs> and that's it. You know, that's the vision of Eddie Coyle, is just that it's just this endless cycle. Um, but it's done so beautifully and so comically. So, yeah, no, I'd say Eddie Coyle is a – Eddie Coyle – I think the most important crime books of the last 50 years are Eddie Coyle and James Elroy's L.A. Quartet. I think those are the books that shook the world in, in sort of the um, crime writing field, personally. Yes, sir? Okay, when did I feel like I was comfortable – and then when did I feel I was comfortable and could make it? Because those are two different, those are two different questions. Um, here's the thing I tell students, which really bums them out. Um, it, it depends upon your age. If you're an undergrad and you're like 19, you don't really care, although you don't get it. If you're 59, you get really pissed off, and you get desperate, and you get unreasonable. It's the only thing that I don't like about teaching older students. It takes 10 years to learn how to do this. Simple as that. It does not take four. It's not some arbitrary thing where you can roll out of bed and say, well, John Grisham did it in a, you know. No, John Grisham didn't. John Grisham was, I trust, studying. Uh, one of the best writers I ever had in my class became a really good writer in three years. But I said to him, who do you read? And he listed the greatest writers of all time. I said, how much have you read? He said, everything. He said, how long have you been reading? He said, 30 years. He was 50. Okay, that's 30 years of studying. That's 10 years. Um, so it takes 10 years to apply yourself to this, to try and figure out how to do it, to, 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 to emulate people, to emulate them so well you don't get caught stealing, to, to realize, to put all the components together, to understand how to do good dialogue, to understand how to do good lyrical writing, to understand how to do description and yet keep the story moving, to understand how to do story that interlocks, to understand story that is both surprising and yet at the end inevitable. I mean, all of these things, and they're not tricks, they're tools. And it takes a long time to learn the toolbox and how to apply it. So I would say eight years in, I published my first novel. And I went, it was kind of like an 18-year-old losing his virginity. It was like, how did I do that? What happened? You know, what, could I do it again? Two years later, I wrote my second book, 10-year mark. And I knew what I was doing. First time you write a book, you don't know what you're doing. You really don't. And you get lucky. And that's why first-time novelists really make me laugh. Because as Richard Price says, yeah, well, one day you're going to run out of autobiography. <laughs> you know? Which is true. So I knew this woman who wrote a book um, identical to her life. She called it fiction. It was identical to her life, straight down the line every single thing in it. And she'd happen to have a colorful life, so it was going to sell. And it did. And it sold. And then she would pontificate to people who had been studying writing for 10, 15 years. We'd be at parties, and she'd be saying, well, when I wrote chapter four, you know, to a guy who just spent nine years studying poetry, studying, you know, taking his boards, doing everything. And I'd be like, oh, dear God. And then she started her second novel. That was 10 years ago. She's still starting her second novel. And she came up to me at a party many years later, and she said, I'm, I'm doing this second novel, and man, it's like really hard. And I'm like, you think? You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, do you really, you know, you got lucky. You told your life story. That's not writing. You just happened to be lucky in that your life story had something very interesting happen in the center of it. I've never written anything about my life story. I don't have an interesting life story. I was 
a white kid who went to college. End of list. <laughs> Check. But uh, Flannery, you know, um, no, Flannery O'Connor said that everything that uh, needs to happen to a writer for a writer to become a writer happens before they're 18. So when they say to you in a writing workshop class, and when you hear this term, because a guy asked me to explain it to him yesterday, write what you know, that doesn't mean that if you're from a family of dry cleaners in Akron, Ohio, you write about being from a dry cleaning family in Akron, Ohio. It means what you know by the time you're 18 or what you know by the time you decide to become a writer is what you understand about the human journey. What do you know about heartbreak? What do you know about irony? What do you know about uh, compromise is something that as I've gotten older has become a sort of defining characteristic of my work in my 40s because I'm starting to understand questions of compromise because you can, it's really easy to be uncompromising when you're 27 years old, you know, super easy. You got no commitments, you got nothing. Suddenly, you get older, you start to stare down the face of certain things and you have kids Compromise becomes a reality. And it becomes Moonlight Miles, the first novel I wrote after I had kids. And the central question of the book is, is it uh, a sin to sell out your character or is it an act of heroism if you do it for your children? That's the question of the book, you know? So uh, I think these are things that we understand. Write what you know means understand what you know about experience. Understand what you know about living and be as honest and as scrupulous as you can and don't engage in wish fulfillment, you know? Wish fulfillment being, you know, we, we could have taken those terrorists out if we just had Schwarzenegger. That's wish fulfillment, you know? That's BS. So um, that's um, something I try to just be as, my whole thing is, is it honest at the end of the day? I'm writing fantastical tales in some ways. I just wrote a gangster book. The body count in this book is just astronomical, <laughs> you know? After three books in which my body count added up to like, you know, like three, you know, suddenly I wrote a book where I think at one point, one chapter, I think 25 people die. Um, so that's a little fantastical, although not if you're in Mexico right now. But you, seriously, that's welcome to the gang war. But, uh, but it, is, it is sort of larger than life. So I'm writing something larger than life, a little more epic, a little more romantic. So I ground every single other detail in as much reality as I can, and I try to write about what you just saw there. You know, a corrupt man who has his principles, but then has to give those principles up, protect his son, and what does that mean? Because from this point on, he's now under their thumb, and the journey continues as the book progresses. So, you know. Yes, miss? Um, sure. Yes. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, the question is, uh, in that chapter that you just heard, I did something that, you know, from a technical standpoint is, is actually a little bit rare or, or certainly bears questioning, which is I switch point of view. So it's in Joe's point of view for the first half of the chapter. The moment he hands that piece of paper to his father, his father picks up point of view and carries it to the end of the chapter. Um, how often do you do that in a book? When can you do it? My rule is you should only be in the point of view of a character um, who has something to lose in the scene. The point of a scene is whether a character either gets what they want or doesn't get what they want. Simple as that. It truly is as simple as that. Um, and, uh, and whether the character uh, has some sort of central dynamic in them altered, changed by experience. That's a, a book is a journey by which a character confronts something that, 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 that should essentially change something in themselves. So a character who has nothing at stake and a character who isn't important to the narrative, except in an informational sense, doesn't get a POV. This is pointless. There's no reason to go into their point of view. Every now and then you, should, you can cheat. If your book's cooking along and you just say, I need to get over here and explain to the audience real fast what's going on, then you go into that guy. But if it's only when the book's cooking along. You'll see at the very end of this book, I all of a sudden click over to a point of view character who's never been a point of view character in the book at all. And he pops in there because at that point, he has a lot to lose. And I, and I break, by that point, that's real late to bring in a point of view character. 
but it's that it's that whole thing of if it's working, you can do anything. If it's not working, you got to follow the rules. So I say you never go into a point of view unless that character is instrumental to the story, unless they have something to lose, unless they are wanting something that's crucial in the in the moment. He wants very clearly to hold on to his principles, and yet he wants to save his son. He doesn't want to sell out, wants to save his son. Takes that guy at the ladder to make him realize it's time to step aside. I'm old. You know, and that's – so does that make, make sense? Um, I heard something great. I'll tell you one other writer thing that I, I – it's my favorite line. And if you follow this, it will help you so much. I, I swear to God. It's cha- it changed a lot for me. David Mamet says that if a character wants so much as a loaf of bread, the audience will follow. And that's the truth. So when you sit there and you say to yourself, I'm going to start a story in which Mike wakes up and he lays in bed. Never start a story in which somebody lays in bed, by the way. Uh, in which he lays in bed and he thinks about his life and he remembers the day that his father took him fishing and what that meant to him. And how that will affect the actual story. Okay, your story is already dead. Nobody's reading it. They stopped reading it, unless they're your instructor. Uh, if Mike wakes up and you get him out of bed, you don't have him waking up. Mike goes to the fridge, opens the fridge, and realizes he is out of milk. You've just started a story. And you can get to everything else. And you can talk about the day Mike's father took him fishing. And you can get to all that, as long as he's heading towards that gallon of milk. And the audience will never stop reading until he gets that gallon of milk, unless you extend it over 400 pages, and then they might check out. But certainly, you just bought 10 pages. If he is heading towards something, that's what people read for. And it's, it's deep in our DNA. It goes back to the very first tales told at a campfire. You know, so fag go out to kill woolly mammoth. Really? And what happened next? <laughs> and that goes to Dostoevsky, that goes to Tony Morris, and that certainly goes to Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare didn't sit around doing a whole act where Claudius was alive. He started with Claudius, the day, the moment Claudius's ghost came back. It's called starting with this day. You don't start on Wednesday if f- Friday's where the action begins. Now, if you can follow that sort of basic law, it's amazing what it does for your work. It's, it's just amazing. And I learned this late in my career. I learned this eight books in. And it changed everything for me in terms of getting the work done. It didn't change the books at the end of the day, but it sure saved me a lot of time. Suddenly I wasn't like, huh, I've just spent two months on that chapter. Why isn't it working? Oh, because somebody just sat in a room and thought for 32 pages. You know, that could be why it's not working. You know, so... Those, that would be some of my best advice. Uh, sir? Yeah, I can say yep. When you're on the radio, do you think about that? No. Uh, when I'm writing a book, do I think about whether it's going to make a good movie or not? I assume, I assume uh, that I know what I'm doing at this point and that I certainly know they're going to come calling because Hollywood only understands the rule of success. It's the only rule they get. So if, if you had three movies in a row about a talking marshmallow and they were hits, you'd have 40 new movies about talking food. So that's what they get. So I've had three movies, two of which have been critical, uh, I mean, commercial successes and critical successes, and all three of which have been critical successes. That means that Hollywood says, I don't know what he knows, but he knows it. So they buy my work. So this sold, this Live By Night sold to the movies, I think, six months ago. Uh, so when I finish a book, uh, wh- so when I'm writing, I do not conflate the two at all. A book is an orange, and, an, and a movie is a giraffe. And they have about that much in common. They have narrative DNA, and that is it. Books are active They are a deep and active relationship between a reader and a writer, and you need to engage a book. You need to engage a movie. A movie is passive. You sit in a movie theater, and you let it wash on over you. Um, So that's why people can easily watch crappy movie after crappy movie, but you probably wouldn't continue with a book you didn't enjoy that much. 
You're like, I got two hours. I'm not doing anything. You know, you sit, flows over you, you walk out the door. So um, uh, when I write a, a script, I'm writing like a blueprint to 150 people. That's how I think of it. I'm just the guy writing the blueprint. And I'm writing to the set decorators, and I'm writing to the scene designers, and I'm writing to the music cue guy, and I'm writing to the actors, and I'm writing to the grips. I'm writing to all those, and I'm writing to the director, definitely, and the producers and everything. When I write a book, I'm writing to one reader. He or she is sitting in a chair. Somewhere, for some reason, I always picture a Victorian. So literary. <laughs> and I can't really see them, but it's a very intimate relationship. And I would argue it's also very much about, I would say, one thing I'd say to my high-level students late in the game is, is the, the last thing to learn and the hardest thing to learn is how to whisper. Because when you shout, people back away. And when you whisper, people lean in. And if you can make your pros whisper, if you have that confidence, then people will lean in. And the final thing I say is writing is seduction. It is about seducing your time away from you. So my job is to talk you in some ways into bed. And you're going to stay there until I let you leave, damn it. Uh, and it's, so it's a very, it's very much, I feel like I'm, I'm performing a very intimate, and it, and, it, and it crosses gender lines. I'm seducing men as well as women, you know, which is odd. But uh, that's what I'm doing. And so it feels just much more personal to me to write a book so when I finish it, then I may go play a parlor game with my wife or something, saying, who could play so-and-so? But my tastes are so indie anyway that I'm completely, you know, I know an actor who would be perfect for this part, but nobody knows who he is. And this movie would cost $100 million to make, so n nobody would ever hire him. So when Leonardo DiCaprio said, I want to play the part, I said, you are perfect. <laughs> because he is. He's great. You know, I just know this kid, this one kid who's an indie actor, I just go, oh, he'd be so good. No, I have no say over it. casting. No, I have no say. No, none whatsoever. There's an old, you know, line in Hollywood about the actress who was so stupid she slept with the screenwriter. Uh, <laughs> no, no. Uh, you know, uh, writers have no po power in Hollywood. Screenwriters have next to none. Novelists have zero. I control right up until the moment I sell to you. And, and I'm very picky about who I sell to. Extremely picky. And then once I sell to you, I owe it to you as a, as a artist to artist, if I respect you, I should respect you enough to stay the hell out of your way. If you want to call me, here's my number. And if you don't want to call for me, I'll see you at the premiere. And it's worked out really well. Uh, I've, I've been consulted on all my films, never about casting. Uh, Clint consulted me about casting. Clint Eastwood consulted me about casting, but <laughs> it, was, it was a rather hilarious conversation. He was like, uh, so who are you thinking for Jimmy? And I was thinking, I said, uh, Russell Crowe. And he said, well, I, I think I just hired Sean Penn. Okay, Sean Penn would be good. Uh, <laughs> And he just went down a list. We talked for like 15 minutes, and every time I'd say somebody, he'd go, yeah, well, I just hired Tim Robbins. Uh, okay, well, this is great. Um, at the end of the day, it's exactly how it should be. The director controls that sort of stuff, and should. So, Yes, ma'am. I have a quick question. Sure. Okay, be careful then. Yes, yes. It's not subconscious. It's, it's clear. It's a link. It's, it's a link. It's yep. like a, yep. And I, because of it, I would say I've been a jazz performer, and I didn't like being kind of a backup. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Right. Okay. So. Um, well, thank you. Yes, it was, that was a very clear, it's no, j it's, it says, he says, he says, he calls himself Maso, but he's, his name is Thomas in Italian, and his father's name is Thomas, and and this is a potential father figure in the mob boss. And then there's an, a, another Thomas later in the book. And oh, yes, that's no, there is no accident there. Here's the accident that kills me. When I created this character, I created him in The Given Day. He's a little boy in the book, The Given Day. And it never occurred to me until after the book was published, because I knew by that point he was going to be my, my gangster. I knew late in the writing of The Given Day, I found my gangster. I've always wanted to write a gangster novel. There it is. Then The Given Day was published, and I said, damn it, his initials. 
you cannot name somebody Joe Coughlin without some snarky critic ultimately <laughs> saying, well, he's obviously a Christic figure, uh, which I was just like, oh, man, I should have named him Charlie. I should have named him anything but JC. But that was a mistake. Uh, but otherwise, no, to Tomas is the, the, the Thomas run is very purposeful in this book. So uh, I'll just make sure somebody you haven't heard from so far. Just this, ma'am, you haven't heard? Yes. How did I get involved with The Wire? Um, uh, D David, I knew David a little bit uh, through his, his wife-to-be, Laura Lippman, who's a friend of mine. Uh, we all spent this wonderful week in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, Harlan Coben, I don't know if you know him, uh, the writer, he was the master at scoring us really great gigs. It was amazing. He's, he's, Harlan works in a room like nobody's business. So he got us this gig one time at Club Med, and they flew us down, and all we had to do was, was talk uh, I had to talk to a group once, and then I had to do a panel one other night. And the rest of the time, we just sat in the Caribbean, and they brought our wives, and, and they paid for everything. And it was like, this is great. This is like early in our careers, too. So David was just starting The Wire then. And we all hung out, and it was there that he decided to hire George Pelicanos. He brought in Pelicanos, and Pelicanos' episode, who'd never written a script before, and Pelicanos' episode was so good that he said, we should get some more novelists. And George said, what about Dennis and Richard? And that's when, it, that's when we were brought on. Richard Price and I were brought on then. And then from that point on, it always went, Richard, uh, Richard wrote his episode, and I followed him. And you're talking, and I'd always get a little choked up because Richard's book, The Wanderers, which I remember when I was 14, was the book that changed my life. It was the book that said, you can be a writer. These, he's writing about the type of people you know. He's writing about the working class. You can write about the working class. You don't have to write about Kings. You don't have to write about Gatsby. You can write about regular people that you know. And so to follow him every season of The Wire was, uh, was really cool. Yeah, it was so neat. So I'll tell you a cute story about The Wire. In the end, I killed the most popular character on The Wire, Omar, and, uh, and did it in a really undignified way. And, uh, and so, um, so David serves that up at a writer's meeting, fifth season. David says, uh, we're going to pop Omar in this episode. And I said, so I got to kill Omar. I got to kill Omar. Great. Because Michael Williams, the actor, and I ran into each other at the premiere of season three. And he said, oh, Dennis, I want you to meet my mom. And I turned. And there's his mom. This is Michael Williams who played Omar. And there's his mom, sweet little old lady. And she looks at me and she grabs my hand in like the tightest grip I've ever had. And she says, don't you kill my son. <laughs> and I said, because I didn't know any better, Mrs. Williams, I would never kill your son. And all I thought of when David said, you're going to pop Omar is Mrs. Williams. Michael Williams' mother is going to kill me. <laughs> so there you go. Final couple of questions? There's, yes, sir. Yeah. Did you initially, when you first did your pilot, was your strong or do you ever feel like anybody else would say, like, oh, you're so good? Where did you get started with that? Oh, no. I, I mentioned authors who influenced me. I read almost no fiction anymore. It's embarrassing. Part of it we finally figured out was because I needed glasses. <laughs> I'd re I was reading. It was no problem, but I'd fall asleep. Everything I read, I was falling asleep. I was like, did books get more boring or is something wrong? Because I kept falling asleep. That's when my wife said, yeah, because your muscles are, are weakening. So then I said, you're lying. But then I finally got tired of falling asleep reading books, so I got it checked out. And now it is kind of cool. I read a lot more now. I'm like, wow, I can read for minutes. <laughs> uh, so no, those are authors I read. Nine times out of ten now, I read nonfiction. I don't read too many novelists anymore. I just don't. I don't have the time. I don't have the concentration level right now. I can read little bits and pieces of, an, of nonfiction. Uh, I don't truly, though, I do not have the time is my issue. I, am, I have projects stacked up, most conservative estimate, between film, TV, and books until 2016. There's no, I don't see daylight. I can't see it um, at all. And sometimes I wake up with friggin' panic attacks. Like boom, 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 boom. As soon as I finish the sequel to this, I have to go on to a television show I agreed to create for Lawrence Fishburne. After that, I have to go on to a long in the works mo movie about something that happened in Boston in the 1960s that I'm writing for uh, the same people who produced Shutter Island and on and on and on. And then I've got this trilogy and then I've got the book after this in the Coughlin cycle and it's just, 
Wonderful. Uh, so it's awesome because this is what I dreamed about my entire life. So it's not a complaint by any means, but it's like, no, when you ask what, what, when push came to shove, what fell out, reading fiction for pleasure is something that I just don't do much anymore, um, which kind of bums me out because why I got into this, but it becomes an occupational hazard, you know? So, yes, sir, you had your hand up earlier. Yes, yes. Um, so there's uh, the, the question of child abuse that shows up in a lot of, particularly my early work, it actually stopped after a certain point. But, it, it, okay, it, it was, and it, it defines my early work is really what the obsession was. Um, and did I, I worked with abused children, and did, does, does that inform the books, and is that why I became a writer? It's not why I became a writer. I was a writer first. Then... When I worked with abused kids, I, I, picked up, uh, I picked up a fury that I'd never had before, at the waste of it. Um, peop the guys I worked with, I remember my boss saying when I finally left uh, uh, social work, saying to me, you're the, best kid, you're, the best, you're the best counselor I've ever seen with kids and the worst I've ever seen with parents. I wouldn't even let you in a room with one. You know, because, and it is, it's true, I'm sorry, the dirty story of social work, we, we talk around it a million different ways, but the dirty truth of social work with kids is simply this. Kids are not fucked up because they came out the womb that way. Kids are fucked up 98% of the time because they had shitty parents. Simple as that, no mystery to it, and I'd be in the rooms with these people and they'd be going, I don't know why he's like this. Because he got you. That's why he's like this. That made me then begin to investigate and look back into where I grew up. I grew up in a really tough town, super tough. I used to pretend it wasn't, but it, it was pretty bad. It was a pretty bad section of the toughest part of Boston. And, um, and I used to say, well, I turned out great. I was fine. What, what was the deal? I went to college. I did everything, you know. The deal was, and my friends didn't. So many of my friends didn't. And it's not all the old cliches. They didn't, like, end up you either went to jail or, you know, whatever. But – a lot of them, you, a lot of them went to rehab, and a lot of them went to jail, and a lot of them just ended up in mundane jobs that led nowhere, and they're still there. So what's the difference? The difference is I won the parental lottery. I had great parents, phenomenal parents. They weren't huggy-feely. They weren't touchy. They didn't want to sit down and talk about your problems. They weren't into encounter groups. They were Irish immigrants from the old school, but they were determined to keep you on the straight and narrow they loved us in the way that they understood love, which was very loving, but just, again, it wasn't huggy and touchy-feely. Um, and they were determined to lay down a structure for us as kids, and they gave it to us. And we, there, were, there were expectations every day you came through that door, and that was the difference. Simple as that. So when people talk about, oh, so and you know, when I hear the, the BS that goes on in this country – which is basically a kind of a blame the victim. You're there because you won't pull yourself up by your bootstraps, or you're there because, you know, you don't understand the value of hard work. Normally talked about by people who were born with silver spoons in their mouths or people who were born on third and think they got a triple. Um, that, that angers me to no end. I watched so many people not make it, and I have massive survivor's guilt because of that. That's what all Mystic River is about. Mystic River is about survivor's guilt. It's about the one guys who, the two guys who think they made it, one really didn't, and and what they feel and how they can't get over it. And I will never get over it. It's like carried for, with me for the rest of my life because the only difference between me and my friend who died of a heroin overdose two years ago is parents. Simple as that. So I didn't do anything for my parents. I didn't earn them, you know. So when I got into social work, same thing. I kept seeing it over and over and over again. And it just gave me a rage at the way that we – we mishandle children in this culture or in the world, globally, globally. And so I just began to question it and investigate it and write about it a lot. And the, one of the most important things to realize if you are a writer or an artist of any kind is, and I believe this now to where I can say it definitively, the answer is irrelevant. The point of the writer, or the point of the artist is to ask the questions. That's your job. That's where drama lives. That's where an interesting story lives doesn't live in sort of saying, I'm going to write and I'm going to tell you why child abuse is bad. And, you know, we all know child abuse is bad. It's what are the levels of child abuse? What is, is it worse to beat a child or to neglect a child? I wonder, you know, 
I have a friend I, who, who believe good liberal granola eating, Volvo driving, NPR listening friend who believed the single most important thing was never hit your kid. Great. And the only problem is, is she began to exile her kids when they were troubling, when they caused trouble. And so she created three kids who were basically banished most of their lives, which is worse because the kids are completely effed up. You know, she never hit them. I'm like, my dad hit me a couple of times. You know, I don't hit my kids, but my father was old school. He didn't beat me. He just, every now and then it was like, uh, I told you not to do that. Give me the strap, you know, like, and, and he'd just be like, tap, tap, but still never hit me in rage, but he hit me. So is hitting worse than my kid's been up in his room playing on his computer for nine hours because he thinks his mother doesn't love him. These are questions that I, I consider a lot and that I ask a lot. Joe is a perfect example in this book. Joe grew up in a household. Some reviewer said recently, I just could never buy why he became a gangster because he grew up so well. And I was like, there's a line that says, I grew up, he says very clearly, he grew up in a nice, home, a nice house, but not a nice home. And so there's this massive distance between his parents, and he's the youngest kid, and his oldest brothers are out of the house, and he lives in this space of just endless loneliness. And that creates him. It creates the hole in the center of him that the book, in the book, he just can't fill. And so, again, I guess I am kind of circling back to an idea of child abuse, but it's not child abuse, it's child neglect by parents who don't know how to raise a kid at this point. So, yeah. Anyway, th I hope that helped. I kind of ramble on when I talk about child abuse. Sorry. Um, okay, final two. Yes, ma'am. Did I study psych? No. No. Um, we think, personally, us writers, us breed, they, they got all their ideas from us. <laughs> you know, we were first. Freud got all his stuff from writers, you know. So we were first, damn it. Um, no, we've been doing this for years. We, we, this is for centuries. Um, I'm fascinated by human beings. I'm fascinated by what makes them tick. I'm fascinated by why they do the things they do. Um, uh, it's funny. The one thing I, I've picked up over the years, and we've now confirmed it conclusively, is without a doubt, I mean, I'm bad at like a 1,000 in the last 10 years. I have crazy instincts about people now. If I meet you and, I th and everybody thinks you're the nicest person in the room, and I'll just nod and smile and say yes, and then and I'll go back and I'll say to my wife, mm, I don't know why, but mm, I don't know why. I don't know why, but the alarm bell's going off, and two years later, that person will embezzle from all their clients or whatever it is. It's this thing now where I do think I have some sort of third eye when I look at people. Um, again, I'd have to talk to you a little bit. I can't just stare at you, so don't run away from me right now. Like, <laughs> I don't want him to sign my book. He's going to know about that time with, uh, you know... <laughs> Um, but yeah, so I think it's just this fascination and this, uh, this endless interest in people and it, and it means I, I, you know, hopefully I write with interesting psychological insight. So, and then, J sir, final question. Do I read the newspapers? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, should I stop? <laughs> uh, I read newspapers. I like newspapers. Um, I, uh. I, I'm very troubled uh, by where we're going news-wise. Uh, I really am. I mean, if our choices are faux new news and MSNBC, we're screwed. You know, I mean, we really are. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty, in case you can't guess, pretty much to the left, but I don't want my news coming from the left, and I don't want my news, I certainly don't want, I heard a great line when they didn't vote on a Pulitzer this year in fiction. Somebody said, what, they couldn't just give it to Fox News? Uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but again, I don't, I don't, but then I don't want something toothless like CNN. I'm really disturbed about the way we're getting our news now. And we've dumbed down the culture so much that that's the only choices left. People won't watch it anymore. People wouldn't watch Walter Cronkite now. You know, it's not jazzy enough. We were, we were literally, just before we came over here, we were watching a newscast in the, lo 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 the local news. And the, the woman giving the newscast, she looked like a Bond girl. I mean, literally, the Bond girl who, like, gets in the karate fight with him, black leather, and she let her have a black leather jumpsuit on. She was gorgeous, but it was like, where's your journalism degree from, hun? You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's really disturbing how we've dumbed down this culture because it's in the best interest of the ruling class to keep everybody stupid. It really is because the dumber this culture gets, the more people are going to forget that they really don't have a future Things aren't going really well, but shit, they got an Xbox, so they're fine. And they got it cheap at Walmart, so it's all okay with a can of beefaroni. It's all good. 
Let's go. Uh, so there we go. I'm going to finish on that. Thank you.